Hello, fellow snappers. Thanks to Mark for sending out the questionnaire, and thanks to you who sent. Thanks to those of you who sent in questions. Much appreciated. We have a lot to get to, so I'm going to jump right in. The first question is from Chris. I've been a fashion commercial photographer for 30 years. I want to transition to storytelling, journalism, fine art. Any any advice? Number one, Chris, you have an enormous leg up. You've been in business for 30 years. 90% of modern photography is business, marketing, et cetera. 10% photography. You have a huge advantage take advantage of it. But the piece of advice I will give you is that storytelling, journalism, and fine art are three separate industries. I would not want to be trying to make a living with storytelling or journalism at this point. Even fine art is going to be a stretch, but here's why I think you should investigate fine art. Fine art is open. There are no rules. You can do anything you can conceivably dream up, and you can justify it if you have rationale for doing so. You can reference an old project. You can reference a new project. You can do something that's already been done by adding a little twist of your own. I love the fine art industry. It's not easy. Uh, commercial photography, I think, is going to be a lot easier go than, than fine art, but that's the genre that I would look into. All right, next question. Choice of focal length for different stories. Uh, that's from Dragontastic. Wow, that's an awesome name, Dragontastic. Choice of focal length, I don't ever have to think about that. I shoot a 50 on my Leica and an 80 on the Hasselblad. Um, with the Fuji, which is sort of the chameleon cameras that I use for all kinds of stuff now, you know, most of the time I'm using a 35 and a 50. Well, I would say 95 plus percent of the time. Occasionally, I will do a story where I need a specific focal length I don't have. Case in point, I have an ongoing project where I needed the 50 to 140 2.8 with a 2x converter. The only reason I bought that lens is this one project. I'll probably never use it again after that. So keep it simple. Choose a focal, single focal length and just shoot that. You know, that way you don't have to ever think about it. Um, what's the disadvantage of using an ISO of 64 when the camera chooses it? Nothing. 64 is slow. You might get a little camera movement, but People shot 64 speed film for decades. Kodachrome 64 was the primary tool for most documentary photographers for several decades, and they were able to pull it off. So there shouldn't be any downside to that. Um, next question from Sergio. You have quite an arsenal of mixed gear. Thank you for noticing, Sergio. 35, medium format, film, digital lenses. Uh, what's the rationale behind it? Oh, this goes back to the last or two questions ago. If I had my choice, Always like a Hasselblad Tri-X. That would be my thing. Problem is, logistically, <clears throat> that doesn't work for me. And now that I don't make my living as a photographer, I'm making pictures for different reasons. And so the Fuji is my default system now because I don't necessarily know what I'm going to have to use or need at some point down the line or what Blurb is going to ask for or what someone else is going to ask for. I kind of have to balance a little differently. So most of the time now I use Fuji. I have a new project that's haunting me because I know I should shoot it with the Leica and the Hasselblad. I just don't know if I will. Okay, next question from Gallo. In one of the last videos, Dan commented that revisiting your photos should be easy if you have a good archive. Uh, it's true. Peter Crow is the reference that you want to look up. He wrote something called the Digital Asset Management Book, the Damn Book. Peter Crow, and it's K-R-O-G-H, I believe. He knows way about more about this than I ever will. You have to have an archive. If I have a lot of, I'm 50 and I have a lot of friends, mentors who are older than me, wildly successful photographers who don't work as photographers anymore. They are living entirely off licensing of their archive. Had they not taken it seriously, they would be in serious financial trouble right now. They're living off these archives for decades. So I, I love when photographers tell me that, oh, they're not really concerned about their archive. That is a very, very short-sighted way to go. You need to own the content, own all your own work, and be able to license that and understand what it means to license an image. So um, check out Peter's Digital Asset Management book. His archiving system is mind-blowingly good, better than mine, and so I don't want to steer you down the wrong channel because mine's okay, and I, I'm not shooting that much, so it's pretty easy to archive things at this point. Next question, how do you find and create your own personal photographic style? And that is from Dimitri. Dimitri, you gotta shoot every single day. And you have to lock yourself in a room with your own thoughts because the last thing in the world you ever wanna do is to shoot and post in real time. Do not share your work online to a bunch of people you don't know who have no training. That is a way to end up with pictures that look like everybody else's and look like everything that's already been done. It took me 10 years of doing assignment work and shooting every single day to figure out who I was. The industry was pulling me in the direction saying, this is the photographer you are, but I knew that I was actually this other person. 
and it took me 10 years to figure that out. Had I let the industry or the audience tell me who to be, I would be miserable right now. So uh, you gotta do it on your own. This is a follow-up to this last question from Dimitri. This is from Raphael. How do you get into the industry? Raphael, I'm curious why you would even want to get into the photo industry at this point. Photography itself is wonderful. It is a great tool. I believe photography is, a, is stronger as a small part of a large conversation. Photography is not that strong anymore as the entire conversation. No one cares. Our, our attention spans are, are super short. People are fickle. They're not paying attention. We live in a post-truth world. I would just focus on however you can make your work, and chances are you'd be happier if you're doing something else for a living and you're doing photography on the side. I know a lot of photographers right now who online make it look like they're all rainbows and unicorns, but in private they're miserable and they're looking for ways out of the industry. Um, Life of Dan Milner, this is from Abir. Life of Dan Milner before he took a course in, fo co uh, course in photojournalism. I was studying to be a geologist. Uh, I love geology, I grew up in the country. I got sidetracked by photography, I turned right, and I never went back to geology. Next question, advice for people looking to move into the field of photojournalism and documentary photography. I wouldn't do that, um, Anthony. I would, again, just to the, answer the last question, find a way to make a living that's outside of photography, and then when you do pick up a camera, you're shooting your pictures and your style on your timeline, and you can make the work that's actually yours. Most of the photographers I know that are working today, with, a, with an exception of an, an older set who are very, very well established, most people are compromised to an unbelievably degrading level. They're, they're immediately compromised by budgets, timelines, attention spans, etc. I just can't imagine it being that much fun. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question was a little repetitive in that same, same uh, genre. Uh, this is a great question from Doug about, I would love to know some things about creating layers within images. So layers are a couple things you have to think about before you even get to the layering. Number one is light. You've got to watch the light and make sure that the light is going to work through your foreground, midground, and background. The second thing, which often gets overlooked, has nothing to do with equipment or technique. It has to deal with dealing with human beings. You have to be able to gauge whether or not you can bridge the gap between someone's safe distance um, and whether or not you can get inside. So you can, I can walk up into a scene and look at someone and think, that guy's going to let me get really close, and that guy is not going to let me get really close. It might take a swing at me. So you have to be able to read people, and that first layer, that foreground, needs to be very, very close, especially if you're working with a 24, 28, 35, 50. You want that first layer very close, and to do that, you have to bridge that gap, which means you have to talk to people. You have to be able to explain who you are, what you're doing, and why it's important. And you have to oftentimes get people from being anti-you to pro-you, because most people are suspicious now. They see you with a camera, they think you're getting rich off of them, they think you're doing an expose, and you have, you're guilty until proven innocent. So you have to very quickly prove your innocence, bridge the gap, get close, and the second thing is you want that lens to be about mid-level on whatever your subject is. So if I was photographing me as the foreground, I would want that lens about waist level, not head level, not feet level, but waist. That's a good way to make yourself feel immersed in a scene. All right, next question. Um, I'm terrible with composition and really would love some tips on to think about composition when taking photographs. Um, and that's from Captured by Anne Marie. So that's tricky because composition, there are rules to composition, but they don't apply to everybody. So everybody sees the world in a different way. The first time I saw Gil Perez's book, Telex Iran, when I was in photojournalism school, it completely blew my head off. I was standing in the Half Price Bookstore in Austin and I opened up this book and my head literally went and just shattered into a thousand pieces because the photojournalism program had tried to direct me into this funnel of composition. And Gil Perez showed me that there was a completely different way of seeing the world. Consequently, Sebastio Salgado taught me how to shoot into the light, taught me how to shoot backlit. The school had taught me that, up, oh, gotta shoot frontlit, sun over your shoulder every single time. So composition is as personal as your fingerprint. It just takes a long time of shooting every single day to figure it out. All right, how do you carry film when traveling, especially through airport security? Yikes, that is from Bashif. That's a tricky question. Go early, be polite, and tell airport security that by law you're, you have the right to ask for a hand inspection. Take the film out of the canisters, put, them, put the film in Ziploc bags, put the Ziploc bag inside of a lead bag, get to security early, have everything out, and tell them you are in no hurry. And expect to be told outlandishly 
inaccurate data from TSA. They do not know what they're talking about when it comes to film and scanning. They just don't. If you're American and you're traveling in Europe or Asia or Latin America, expect to be hassled for being an American and for traveling with film. It's par for the course. Again, go early, be polite, let it bounce off of you and just go. Now the funny part is, and the positive part, is that oftentimes airport security, once you get past those initial hurdles, they love the fact that you're shooting film. You'll get, a lot of times you'll get comments of like, oh my God, I miss film. I loved photography when it was film based. Now I don't like it and it's phones, blah, blah, blah. And people will go off on this. Just be patient, you'll get, you'll get your way. Last, uh, last question, what do you do after you take the picture? Where does the picture end up? What's the purpose of it? Um, for me personally, I'm a little atypical, I don't care. The thrill is to make the pictures in the field. I have no dog in the, in the hunt. Uh, after the fact, I'm not trying to be a photographer. I'm not trying to impress anyone. I'm just packaging things up into small books for myself and moving on and doing another project. Um, I don't, I've never tried to put my hands or the value of my work in the hands of other people because it's just too fickle. You know, you're going to fail nonstop as a photographer. 99% of the pictures you take are not going to work. That's true for a hundred percent of the photographers walking the earth, regardless of what they make it look like online. 99% of what we do fails. We're like baseball players. If we bat 300, we're considered a genius. So celebrate the failures, develop your own style, make unique work, and enjoy the process. That's all we can ask. Thanks for the questions, and I'll be back with another roundup, hopefully in the near future.